Earnings season kicks off, military tension bubbles up, and consumer sentiment takes a leg lower. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. We have a proper sell-off yeah, underway here. Big sell-off here and a lot of questions about what's really going to transpire over the next few days. Yeah, and also, do you just buy the dip on Monday once you get through yeah. the weekend? So let's get a check in here on where markets are trading around the lows of the session with the S&P down 1.6%. Obviously, the Russell and tech uh, really underperforming there. Obviously, you get a spike in the VIX. So you have 18 handle now uh, on the VIX. And you have a safe haven flow. You have a move into Treasury markets. You have uh, the 10-year yield is up by about, excuse me, down by about 10 basis points. Bloomberg dollar index getting another safe haven boost. The yen, a little bit of a safe haven boost. I want to highlight gold for a moment because that did break 2400. Now it's selling off. In theory, that's what gold's supposed to do. You sell it when you need it and when you're nervous, etc. But that's sort of a safe haven play. But remain. Man, it is a safe haven Friday. That's uh, certainly what we're seeing there, that flight to safety. And in addition to that move higher that we're seeing in the VIX, and of course that three-day bid into the dollar, really pay close attention to the full-on embrace of treasuries. Because remember, it has been rare where we've seen treasury prices, oil prices, and dollar pricing move in relative lockstep in the same session. That's an indication that investor complacency, that complacency of the past few weeks, might finally have been broken from its slumber. A soft reading on consumer sentiment from the University of Michigan not helping matters either as Americans once again starting to grouse about that higher inflation. Meanwhile, you got no respite from the first batch of corporate earnings this morning. Six financial companies in the S&P reporting today, and right now, five of them selling off into the close. J.P. Morgan having its worst day in a month after net interest income slightly missed analyst estimates and full-year expenses were guided higher. BlackRock hitting the lowest intraday level in two months. This as net inflows came up short of some expectations. And Wells Fargo falling for a fourth day amid muted loan growth and increased pressure to pay out more for deposits. A conversation in just a second with Wells Fargo CFO Mike Senemasimo. And on that point about those higher deposit costs, just a while ago, our very own Mike McKee he had a chance to catch up with the Boston Fed President Susan Collins. She has a stance right now on interest rates that suggests banks shouldn't expect Fed cuts to provide any relief anytime soon. I don't see urgency and I see lots of reasons for patience. And over the longer term, I think we'll, uh, my expectation is that we will ease and that over the longer term inflation uh, interest rates will be at lower levels. My baseline would still have us starting to ease later this year, but when I see is likely to be later than I had been previously thinking. Boston Fed President Susan Collins speaking a little bit earlier, Alex, and we should point out here that the price action we're seeing today, this is not sort of the fall off the cliff moment. No. But when you consider just how complacent things have been over the last few weeks and really months, this is pretty surprising what we're seeing today. I'm glad you brought up complacency yeah. because we're starting to kind of see that filter through in some of the volatility uh, indicators. I mentioned the VIX earlier, and let me just break it down a little bit more for you. So the move index, which reflects Treasury volatility, that's the blue line. The yellow line is the JP Morgan uh, G7 volatility index, so it's FX. And then you have the white line, which is the VIX. So as you can see, no surprise here, they're all kind of starting to move higher. But the reason why you find that interesting is the last time we saw a nice spike higher across really in the move index, currencies, but really also in equities, was when we hit that low for the S&P back in October of 2023. The last time we saw the spike was during the SVB crisis uh, back in March. So are we kind of headed towards that again? Or is this the dip that people are going to step in yet again, Romaine, and buy? All right, we're going to piece all of this together for you because a lot of big things really moving the market today. So we're going to start off the show here with a closer look at those bank earnings. David Conrad joining us right now, U.S. large cap bank equity research analyst over at KBW. KBW, a Stiefel company. All right, David, let's start off sort of with the broader picture here. We heard from several banks this morning, including Citi, Wells, as well as J.P. Morgan here. I think J.P. Morgan was pretty candid about what's going on in the deposit space with net interest income, and more importantly, how interest rates are feeding into that here. What was your main takeaway? I mean, I think the main takeaway this morning was you started off with three bank stocks that were all up over 15 percent year to date. So they were the strongest banks uh, heading into this. And there was big expectations for them uh, because of the shift in the curve. And so these are the three kind of more asset sensitive names. And there was big expectations for them to raise the guidance. And we got a little bit of a raise from JP Morgan, but that was, you know, the market expectations were priced for more given the valuations of JP Morgan. And then on, on Citi and Wells Fargo, 
you know, actually pretty solid quarters, but uh, no change in the, in the outlook. And so that was the disappointing part. And, you know, you take that in, in, into the uncertainty of, of the funding costs going forward. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's tough for the banks to get a lot of traction until we get maybe two, three cuts behind us. And then you start getting a little bit of uh, a, a lot of help in net interest income with, with some of the back book repricing. But, yeah. you know, this kind of makes this year look pretty challenging. Well, ex- well, explain that to me here. I mean, even if it does say we get two cuts right now, which seems to be what the market is pricing in, that doesn't seem like a lot to me in terms of it being a boost to earnings. But you think that could help if we do actually get those? No, I think I think what I'm trying to express is the first two are kind of mixed, right? Mm, because okay. you may not get a lot of consumer deposit repricing with two. Where we think the real benefit is in the shift in NII is when you get the third, fourth, and fifth cut. And that's when you can start getting the consumer and the funding costs down um, and, and the yield curve will be shaped a little bit better. And so that's why if we only get two this year, it, it, it'll set up for a little bit more of a challenge. It, would it be fair to say, David, that maybe J.P. Morgan is just setting us up for a good investor day. Like they're saving the good stuff for investor day because some of the things you can complain about, like will resolve itself. And okay, fine, they're being conservative on net interest income. Okay, that makes good sense. The FDIC money, okay, that makes good sense. Are they just setting us up? Well, that's typically not what they do, but I would tell you in recent history that has been what's happened. They've been very, they've been the most cautious bank out there uh, on the outlook of deposit funding costs and their net interest income. And frankly, they've beaten that pretty handily, you know, the prior probably three quarters. And so that kind of set up a little bit enthusiasm into the stock. And now this quarter um, is a little bit light in II. And then the guide, again, they, they, they raised their guidance, but the market was expecting a lot more. And so I think there's a little bit of truth to what you're saying, but um, that's not historically what they do. But but recently, they've come in a lot better than their expectations. Something that it felt like um, Jimmy Diamond highlighted on all the calls was just the disparity among income levels, right? Like in terms of their card uh, uh, issuance and the kind of money that people are spending, we're really seeing a divergence, right? Do you expect to hear that from the likes of, say, Bank of America next week? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would echo that in, in cities' results, too. We, we saw that, and that's kind of... A little bit of the factor why that stock rolled over is that there's a real discrepancy between the net charge-offs in their branded cards and then what they call retail services, which is kind of the private label uh, department store credit cards, if you will. Um, real stark comparison there where you know their, their charge-offs and the retail solutions were already above their full-year guide this quarter. And so I think a lot of the commentary we're going to hear, you know, for instance, from Bank of America, is, is just the wind down of excess balances and checking accounts and how, you know, the, the lower the lower income part might be actually now at or below, you know, the pre-pandemic checking account balances, uh, which will put further pressure on the consumer. And that's that's frankly why we've seen such credit card growth recently as well. I am curious, David, about the regulatory overhang. I know all each of these banks kind of have their own distinct issues in that regulatory environment. Then, of course, there's still some of the umbrella issues dealing with uh, Basel III and, and that whole end game here. Is that something that investors should still pay close attention to? Or do you think that the banks have telegraphed enough how they're going to handle it? Well, I think the Basel III end game is still a, a major headwind and, and an uncertainty Although we do believe that um, the Fed is looking to to kind of pull back some of the capital requirements there, but that remains to be seen. I, I would say that you know the banks have improved their capital quite a bit. Now the backup we've seen in interest rates so far this quarter uh, will kind of offset that a little bit. And I and I think also the other you know benefit to capital, but but you know not to the stocks is we haven't seen any loan growth. And so that's allowed the banks to kind of build up capital in preparation for the Basel III end game. But that is still a, an uncertainty and a, and a headwind. And I, I feel like uh, the market has really already discounted that as being watered down pretty significantly. 
All right, David, going to have to leave it there. Always great insights. David Conrad, U.S. large cap bank equity research analyst over at KBW, a steeple company with stocks across the board for the S&P, the Dow and NASDAQ now hitting session lows as we count it down to the close. Coming up, a conversation with the CFO of Wells Fargo, Mike Santamassimo. All right, plus renewed fears around geopolitical risks for a flight to safety. Uh, Yuri and Timmer, director of Global Macro Fidelity, will be joining us uh, with his take. And as we focus on rates, a focus well on mortgages and how some of those lower mortgage rates, at least for those people <clears throat> who managed to lock in those super low mortgage rates. Guess what, Alex? They refused to move. <laughs> Apparently, it's having some issues in the labor market, that conversation, and so much more coming up next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. season is here. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Now, shares of Wells Fargo are down about 1%. The bank reporting a revenue beat and a net interest income miss. Now, this is the struggle. We heard this from J.P. Morgan also. Muted loan growth and increased pressure to pay out more for deposits. All of that eats into profits. Well, joining us now for more is the CFO of Wells Fargo, Mike Santomassimo. Th joins us now. Thank you so much, Mike. It's really good uh, to chat with you. We always appreciate you coming in uh, every earnings day around this time. Let's talk about deposits for a moment. How much do you think you're going to have to increase those deposit rates to keep the deposits that you still have? Well, first, thanks. Uh, thanks again for having me. You know, I think you know what we're seeing in the quarter with net interest income and deposits is exactly what we thought we would see. Um, you know, for the most part, and, and I think when you look at you know overall sort of levels, they came in slightly better than we thought. Loan growth is slightly less. That's offsetting some of that. Um, but what we're seeing, you know, in, in the book, both on the consumer and the commercial side, is exactly what, what we expected. You know, on the commercial side, we're not, uh, we're not you know, the, those deposits are, have been competitive from a pricing perspective now for a while. And that'll stay, that'll stay the case uh, as we look forward. On the consumer side, what we're seeing really is people spend uh, money that's in their checking accounts. And in some cases, reallocate money to CDs or, or savings vehicles. And that's what's causing sort of the increase in interest expense you know, on the consumer side. But, mm -hmm. but overall, it's exactly kind of what we thought would be happening as we came into the quarter. But Robin and I were just talking about this before the show that was so interesting to both of us, that non-interest bearing deposits fell 18% in the quarter uh, compared to the same period a year ago. You guys still have non-interest bearing deposits? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, look, I think, you know, when you look at kind of core, you know, operating accounts, checking accounts, you know, that, that's what makes up the bulk of that. Plus, you know, some commercial uh, deposits sort of fall into that uh, category. Uh, you know, but the decline you've seen has just been a natural progression throughout the year as people spend down. And the biggest driver really continues to be consumer spending uh, and some reallocation into uh, CDs and other, and other products. So what do we talk about, Mike, when you look forward into the year? I know I, on the conference call, you guys talked a little bit about your credit cards and some other products here. The idea that there is something coming down the pipeline that maybe, maybe can sort of help boost growth here. What are you ho hoping for? Yeah, well, I think you have to look at the, the revenue line in total when you sort of think about that. And then I think, you know, in the quarters, I think a good example, we had really good fee growth, you know, across most products and most businesses. Um, and when you look across the year, you know, hopefully we'll continue to see some good uh, benefit from those investments we've been making that's been driving some of that, some of that growth as well. And on net interest income, it's going to be uh, a, a function of what we continue to see with rates, what we continue to see with how, how uh, clients behave with deposits and how much they reallocate to other products, how much they spend how much loan growth we see from you know, both the consumer and the commercial side. So there's a lot of variables that sort of go into it. Um, but as we said on the call, you know, we feel better about where we are today than we did in January. 
but I think there's a lot to play out through the rest of the year, and we'll see. You know, we'll see how things progress. But I, I do want to kind of stay on credit cards because, on one hand, I, that did appear to be a bright spot. You had decent growth. I think it was something like six percent. Correct me if I'm wrong. But that came because of higher loan balances, which of course would raise the question about the ability, the capacity of those folks to repay that. What's the balance looking like right now? Well, Romain, a lot of the fun, a lot of the growth we're seeing in the in the credit card business is a function of what we've been doing and investing in over the last three years. So we've at, we've launched a whole bunch of new products um, in the last two and a half years. Those are getting really good traction from both the, our existing customers and new customers, and that's what's driving a lot of the growth there. Not necessarily just existing customers growing their 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 balances higher. Some of that's happening uh, as well. And as you would expect, you know, there's some customers that need to do that to continue to, uh, you know, deal with with all the things they need to deal with in their life. But but what we're seeing there is just some some natural progression of charge offs, natural deterioration of that portfolio that you would expect coming off really the historic lows that we saw during COVID. So, and everything is really performing as we thought it would at this point. When you look at all the different products, the vintages, the different types of customers, so we're not seeing anything that would fall outside of what we would have uh, thought uh, in our expectations. What about growth, say, uh, internally with investment banking uh, and trading as well? Like, when does the asset cap kind of get put to the side and you can really make the investments that you want to be making in there? What does growth look like? Well, again, we've been investing in those businesses, too, now for the last number of years. And I think you're, you, know, you saw some of the benefit of that, those investments coming through in the quarter. On the investment banking side, we, had a, you know, we participated in what was a pretty strong uh, fee uh, quarter for the industry. Uh, you saw that in investment-grade debt capital markets. That's a business we've been very good in for a very long time. We saw some higher advisory fees you know, off the back of some of the investments we've been making with people and uh, wow. in relationships there. Uh, so that's good, and I think that'll that'll continue to uh, play out over time, as, as you know, assuming the market cooperates with us. And on the trading side, it's it's similar. We've been investing in technology, people, and and you're continuing to uh, uh, you know see that. But that is definitely a business. The trading business is definitely a business where it's been more constrained by the size of the balance sheet uh, over the last few years. Uh, and as we have more flexibility, we'll be able to deploy more resources there over time. Right. So. Flexibility, aka regulatory uh, work that you guys have to do. You guys inherited a lot of stuff. The baseball analogy: What inning are you in? Um, the ninth inning, sort of like you're done, you're off to the races. Well, I think um, you know, as as I've said, you know, on, on this, you know, in this forum, a, a number of times, like you know, we're we're continuing to, to make that our the finishing that regulatory work is our top priority. We're going to continue to do that focus on it with, with everything we've got to get through it. You saw uh, you know, one of our consent orders related to sales practices uh, terminated in the first quarter, so I think that's a good sign you know, for, uh, you know, for all the work that we've been doing. We're thankful for all the effort people put in for that. Um, and so we're going to continue to stay focused on it, and we're not going to stop until we're done with all of it. All right, Mike, really appreciate you taking time for us. As always, Mike Senemasimo, he's the CFO over at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo share is down only about uh, seven tenths of a percent. I say only because at least relative to the rest of the banking sector right now, that's actually one of the outperformers here. Uh, all but one stock in the uh, KBW Bank Index right now in the red. That index now uh, headed towards its lowest levels in more than two months. Yeah, I should point out that uh, President Biden uh, says that he does expect an attack on Israel sooner, not later, but that he warns Iran to not attack and that happened just a few moments ago and then we're right around the lows of the session so it's very clear there's some geopolitical risk premium and some safety uh, premium sort of being built into different uh, markets you have to wonder if we get to the next 48 hours what monday brings well of course a lot of things that will change when we get to monday and you kind of wonder if this had all this news had come out say on a wednesday or a thursday will we see the same price reaction a lot of people not necessarily wanting that exposure into the weekend you see that in the options markets the hedges on puts really starting to pick up you saw the vix elevated here and of course that bid into treasuries and that bid into the dollar stick with us this is romaine bostic and alex seal counting you down to the close on bloomberg
All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls. We'll look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. So we're going to start with Sienna. City actually reinstating coverage on the network communications company, a sell rating and a $44 price target. Not good. The analyst saying that he likes Sienna's established leadership position, particularly when it comes to a lot of the transport business that it does. But, and also in that data center interconnect business, but says that the bottom line benefits from AI networking traffic, they're still maybe 18 to 24 months out. Shares of Sienna down more than 3% here on the day. Next up, let's take a look at Corteva. This is the seed and pesticide giant getting cut to neutral today over at JP Morgan. With crop chemical prices falling, the analyst says Corteva has its work cut out for it to reach its earnings guidance for 2024. He also cites continued destocking from some of those South American and European customers saying that right now none of them are rushing to make any repurchases. Those shares are moving lower by almost 5% on the day. And finally, let's take a look at BF Corp. You know it is the maker of Vans and the North Face. A downgrade today to neutral from Outperform. This over at BNB Paribas Exame. The apparel company appears to be in a hard place for now. That's what the analyst says. And he expects downward revisions to the fiscal outlook as that company still deals with ongoing challenges almost across its entire product line. And that includes Vans, Dickies, as well as Timberland. Those shares moving lower on the day by about 8%. And those are some of our top calls. And Alex, I do want to stick on BF Corp for a second here because this really is a consumer spending story. One was interesting about that note here was them cutting the free cash flow target pretty dramatically down from $900 million to five hundred. million. And it kind of gets to what we were talking with the Wells Fargo CF about, all about. I, I don't know how much consumer spending is holding up. I mean, we have little nuggets here that it is, but we have quite a few other nuggets that seem to show it's really slow. Yeah, I'm looking at my notes here for the Jamie Dimon quote saying that extra spending money like the COVID stimulus, et cetera, mm -hmm. is, quote, about done for lower 50% of consumers and that their lower income segment of the portfolio for credit cards is struggling a bit. So, I mean, to point out what's going to save that. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there is. I mean, certainly, right. certainly not something, nothing out of Washington because they can't get their act they can't together get and done. it's election year. So we're not going to see anything there. But it gets to this idea, too. You talk about sort of uh, we get, I think we get retail sales next week and a couple other economic data points. But those economic data points still seem to show resiliency there. Right, because, well, yeah. but it's the same thing we talked about yesterday with the NFIB yeah. versus the large KPMG CEO mm -hmm. sentiment, right? Yeah. Smaller guys struggling, larger guys may be okay. And if you're the Fed and you have a bifurcated economy like that, how do you really look like that? How do you act when you're looking at two different types of economies? Yeah, and it, it is. And we've had these kind of dual economies for a while. I think sort of why we ignored it for a while is to a certain extent everybody was sort of being lifted Stimulus up. Stimulus money, man. Yeah, exactly. COVID money. Yeah. All right, coming up, you got safe haven demand is bol bolstered by geopolitics. The S&P just four points away from its 50-day moving average. We're going to break all this down with Yuri and Timmer, Director of Global Macro Fidelity Management and Research. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. I mentioned it before we went to break here, but we're at uh, 51.12 for the S&P. And I say that because we're just two points away from the 50-day moving average. If we close below that, do we see some follow-through selling? And it is a nice drop until we get to that 100-day. You've seen a lot of other breaches in key technical levels. Keep an eye on that Russell 2000 as well. Yes. Now back below 2000. All right. Well, all of this has the geopolitical and safe haven trade feel. President Biden issuing a stark warning about the Middle East. How imminent do you think an attack on Israel is from Iran, Mr. President? I want to get a secure information for my expectations sooner than later. Mr. President, what Mr. is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. I want to bring in Balance of Power co-host Kaylee Lyons joining us for more. Kaylee, what can we expect over the next 48 hours? What is the Biden administration preparing for? Well, what we know based on Bloomberg sources familiar with Western intelligence is that Israel is preparing for potentially as soon as Saturday a direct strike from Iran onto Israeli soil that could hit uh, Israeli government targets. This, of course, would be in retaliation for that strike we saw in Iran's embassy in Syria, which killed military personnel from the Iran Revolutionary Guard, which was blamed on Israel. There are remaining questions, though, as to what exactly could happen within the next 48 hours if we were to see some drone and missile strikes going toward Israel, just how escalatory it could be here, whether Iran would do this directly or a proxy like Hezbollah could do it. What kind of value could they go after in terms of targets? But what we did just hear from President Biden as we we just heard is that he does expect this will happen sooner rather than later. While he warned Iran not to, he also returned to the microphone to say the following. This is a quote. 
We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel and help defend Israel, and Iran will not succeed. And again, nothing has happened yet, but our reporting also indicates that the U.S. is preparing defense, has moved additional military resources into the region. So it's just a matter of how things unfold for he- from here. What there is concern, though, is depending on the decision from Iran here, the form this retaliati- retaliation could take, how much further it could escalate broader hostilities in the region. All right, Akili Lines uh, down in Washington there with stocks at session, lows, the VIX above 18, Brent crude at 90 bucks a barrel and a strong bid into the dollar. Urian Timmer joining us right now. He's the director of Global Macro over at Fidelity Management and Research. And uh, Urian, uh, there was so much talk coming into this week about the Fed, about earnings and about interest rates. And we kind of forgot about that lingering issue that's been out there for quite some time. And that is uh, the war in the Middle East. It's already a war. Let's just call it that here. Uh, Without really speculating as to what actually could happen this weekend, how do you position around these types of black swan or gray swan type of events? You know, it's always uh, a very difficult question for investors, and obviously the headlines that we're hearing uh, are very troublesome. Um, You know, for for the markets, it's a question of, you know, what what is systemic to the economy, what is not. Obviously, uh, war in the Middle East, you know, is is very, very worrisome. Um, But ultimately, and I hate to sound disconnected and cold and calculating, but for the stock market, you know, it's about earnings and interest rates. And earnings did inflect higher last year. And uh, we're obviously about to get Q1 earnings season starting next week. We already got a few um, reports now this week. But earnings are on a good track. Um, and it's the interest rate part that is, I think, giving the markets here a wobble beyond, mm-hmm. obviously, the geopolitical headlines. And we're in a market where, you know, interest rates matter. Uh, the Fed is very likely to cut a lot less than the market was expecting you know, earlier this year. Right. Um, if three or four is the new two on the inflation front, um, and the Fed aims to have, you know, let's say, 100 basis point real rate in a soft landing uh, type of policy, then there really isn't much more than one or two rate cuts ahead of us. And that's something the market needs to price in. And I think the market's resilient enough to withstand it. Yeah. But it does affect well, the valuation in the S&P 500 and well, other instances. Well, when you look at that increase in valuation that we've seen over, I don't know, the last few months or so, the, in anticipation of those five or six rate cuts that clearly we're not going to get, at least not in 2024 here, how much of a downward re-rating do we need? Because it's one thing to say, OK, the market will be under pressure. That's not the same as saying the market is going to crash and into, you know, correction or bear market. Uh, exactly. So last year when earnings were declining very modestly, albeit, um, the market was, of course, obsessed with, you know, how much more is the Fed going to hike? When is it going to stop? When is it going to start cutting? How many times? And, you know, if you think about valuation as the present value of future cash flows, right, per a DCF model, a discounted cash flow model, um, you know, interest rates matter when there is no earnings growth. Like there, that has a, a a a big influence on the valuation. And last year, the market was, you know, rightfully obsessed, if you will, with uh, with the Fed. I think this year, the market obviously is concerned. It's interested. I mean, it's part of the valuation structure. But earnings are now growing at about ten percent per year, and that provides a buffer to the Fed not cutting rates as many times as we were expecting earlier this year. Um, and so that is you know, a much better backdrop. But nevertheless, you know, since the market kind of like yeah. looked into the abyss last October when the bond yield went to 5%, yeah. um, the S&Ps rallied you know, 28% until the, the most recent high. That's a big run. Um, yeah. And uh, some consolidation certainly is understandable here. And Alex, uh, we should point out, too, we are getting some heads right now on uh, Mary Daly over in San Francisco Fed, basically reiterating what we've heard from a lot of Fed members, which is that they're not really ready to do much right now. We heard that from Susan Collins, and we also heard that, of course, from the Kansas City Fed president a little bit earlier as well, Jeffrey Schmidt. United in the pushback. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much uh, the idea. So you're in, what do you do? I mean, in that case, do you join in the sell-off? Do you need to buy the dip? Because there's going to be big companies with nice cash flow like tech, no matter what happens with uh, rates. I, it's always a good opportunity to rebalance when some volatility um, happens, and you know the market you know is barely off the high, so not. 
that much has happened, at least on in terms of the price action. But overall, I think we're still in a good place in the cycle. You know, the typical cyclical bull market produces a 90% rally over 30 months. We've done 50% over 17 months. The earnings picture, as I mentioned, is now inflecting upward. Um, the Fed is, you know, likely done at least raising rates, yeah. even if it doesn't give back some of those rate hikes right away. And so the fundamentals are are good. But the P.E. has rallied from 15x in October of 2022 to 21x, and that's a big valuation rally. And, um, you know, some correction is always possible. And for the long-term investor, it's an opportunity to rebalance to make sure you're in the portfolio that you want to be in. Yeah. And I think that's the opportunity here. What do you do then with bonds uh, at this point? Because, yeah, okay, you're shaking your head. What do you do with them? <laughs> um, bonds are... So the whole 60-40 and the correlation between stocks and bonds, I find the most fascinating aspect of the market's dynamic right now. So back in the day before the great moderation in the early 2000s that flipped the correlation between bonds and stocks upside down, meaning stocks and bonds have been negatively correlated for the last 25 years until two years ago, of course, um, before that time, stocks and bonds were positively correlated. And back in those days... Yields would push up and it would get to a breaking point in the stock market. Uh, and that's the opposite of what we're used to over the past couple of decades, where you'd have a shock in the market and that would push yields down. And that 40 would save you in a, in a, you know, against losses on the 60. I think we're back in the old days where the correlation is positive. Yeah. That doesn't mean investors shouldn't own bonds. I mean, you're getting a, a positive real yield now, which is great. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's a coupon clippers market. And, um, and I don't know if I would really want to get too long in the duration mode. But yeah. intermediate bonds, I think, have a value and they have a place, even if it's not for that negative correlation anymore. All right. Well said. You're in. Have to leave it there. You're in Timmer, director of global macro over at Fidelity Management and Research. And uh, we check in on the market. So once again here, Alex, uh, still uh, at those session lows. I was looking at some of the individual movers because I was trying to see, uh, are there safe havens in the equity market? And you find a couple here, including Apple, getting actually getting a pretty strong bid uh, relative to uh, the other magnificent seven up uh, about six tenths of a percent uh, here on the day. Well, that's so interesting because yeah. um, A, you're seeing earnings revisions actually move higher for those names, which is different than before. And also they're, they're minting money at this point. This is not like we're going to discount future cash flow mm -hmm. with higher rates and that winds up hurting the stocks. Yeah. No, they're making money today. They have money yeah. today. And it's interesting too and it's interesting too we talk about the run up in valuations. Why is Nvidia down? Why is Amazon down? Why is Microsoft down? They've already hit those highs. Right. Apple of course was the laggard. All right, a lot more coming up here. We actually believe it or not, Alex Steele you had an IPO today. You did? Yeah, I on know. This day? Uh, actually, UL Solutions, you've heard of it. It's old school, and now it is new school. Fresh on the market, 21% pop. It's our stock of the hour. Up next on The Close on Bloomberg. been planning this IPO for a fairly long time. As we looked for the right timing for the IPO, we did look at some longer term trends around, in general, where investors who were seeking high quality assets, uh, when they were ready to uh, take on the IPO risk and uh, jump on board with us. All right, Jen Scanlon there, the president and CEO over at UL Solutions. That is our stock of the hour, and it is, well, a new stock. The safety testing and inspection company made its trading debut earlier under the ticker ULS. It sold yesterday at 28, opened at 34, now trading right around 33.97. Jess Menton joining us right now, deputy team leader for equities here at Bloomberg. I think it's funny she said we could have waited even longer. I, I mean, this company is like, what, like 500 years old or something? I think it was, it was started in the 1800s. Right, well, um, maybe like yeah, it's more so, like a century. Okay, but yeah, when you're right. looking at this, and also to put in yeah. context, because we're talking about this safety inspection company, it's basically when you see the UL in a circle on any sort of appliances, smartphones, things like that, people might overlook it often. But mm -hmm. that's what that company is doing. And so you look at this, and even their CEO was just talking about how they put off going public the last couple of years. Not surprisingly, because we know the Fed's been on this really aggressive run here with raising interest rates, but then everybody wants to know, especially when you're seeing the economy hold up well, as well as the broader stock markets, if more companies are going
going to come public here. So when you have a company like this actually pricing at the top end of its range, because the last few, that was the issue because people obviously were so excited last year about ARM. We just had Reddit recently too, but some of the problems were if they're not pricing at the high end and more of the middle, what was going on with the issues with people maybe getting the valuation expectations wrong. But when you see something like this, maybe does that mean we'll see more come through the pipeline? So I know a lot of investors are really eager to see that, especially with the public markets. Yeah, it was so amazing that it's up, you know, 21% right. in a really tough market day. Like, imagine if we had had, like, a nice rally day and then I know. also IPOing, too. Um, right. We, we, so do we, do we learn anything macro signal-wise or capital markets-wise uh, in terms of the pipeline from this? Right. But so when you do see something like this, to your point, I mean, up over 20% for this stock, when you're looking at the S&P 500 on pace for its worst week of the year, and it would be its worst week since October if these declines hold till the closing bell. But when you get different reads like this, this could give optimism, especially for traders and deal makers that are yeah. on these typical desks that maybe we could see more companies go more forward with this and what that means for the economy, especially when you have the resilient growth like this. All right, Jess, thanks a lot. Super appreciate Jess Menton uh, from Bloomberg uh, joining us there. We are off the lows of the session. I should point out that out the S&P off by one and a half percent. We're going to count you down to the closing bells with Nancy Tangler, a CEO and CIO over at Laffer Tangle Investments. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Ten minutes until we get to those bells, Alex, and setting up here for what's going to be one of the worst days that we've seen all year long. But, you know, we are off the lows, and I say that because the S&P briefly breached its 50-day moving average, and now we're up above that uh, by about uh, 12 points. The Russell, though, not as lucky, down by about 2% below that moving average, definitely key. Also, tech getting beaten up, uh, down by 1.6, although it could have been worse. Uh, and I just wanted to point out oil. We're obviously having a bid into the bond market, Romaine, but also with oil because of the geopolitical risks. But, again, off the high and gold kind of selling off, playing its role as a safe haven, right? You buy into the risk and then you sell when the risk is actually there. So interesting data unfold as we head to the close. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how much of this price action is directly tied to geopolitics, how much of it is involving earnings and how much of it is still about the Fed and rates. That Fed speak continued today and earlier we had a chance to catch up with Yuri and Timmer over at Fidelity Management. Here's what he had to say about the Fed outlook. We're in a market where, you know, interest rates matter. Uh, the Fed is very likely to cut a lot less than the market was expecting you know, earlier this year. Right. Um, if three or four is the new two on the inflation front, um, and the Fed aims to have, you know, let's say, 100 basis point real rate in a soft landing uh, type of policy, then there really isn't much more than one or two rate cuts ahead of us. And that's something the market needs to price in. And I think the market's resilient enough to withstand it. Yeah. But it does affect well, the valuation in the S&P 500. All right, one of the great views we had on the program a little bit earlier, and now we get another one with Nancy Tangler, CEO and CIO over at Laffer Tangler Investments, helping us count down to the closing bells here. And Nancy, uh, without getting too much into some of the day-to-day -day moves that we've had, uh, there has been a broader narrative here, this idea that you had supportive economic conditions. We were heading into an earnings season that at the very least also seemed like it was also going to be supportive of potential upside in the markets. Of course, now we have to deal with this specter of war in the Middle East, maybe bubbling back up and other geopolitical issues here. How do you make sense of that all as a longer term investor still having, though, to keep a focus on these day to day moves? Yeah, thanks for having me, Romaine. Um, I think a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, volatility is the friend of the long-term investor. So you can use these opportunities, these days, um, and maybe not today on a Friday going into a weekend uh, with uncertainty in the Middle East, but you can use volatility to the downside uh, in your portfolio as a way to add high quality names. And that, that's what we'll be doing next week. Uh, we still think the trend line is up. We still think we're in a bull market. And I still think the analogy to the 1990s that I've been talking about about for nine, 10 months uh, is, is intact. And geopolitical shock and war was also part of the 90s. So mm -hmm. that is not to make light of it. It is also not to say that there won't be continued volatility. But I think that what we saw in the bank earnings was not all that bad. Um, 
mo most of the stocks were up pre-market. It was the, the acceleration of, um, of the war talk, the drumbeat. And I think that's really what spooked stocks and drove investors into bonds. So when you saw the earnings that we got this morning, City, Wells, uh, JP Morgan, a couple others here, that gave you confidence, Nancy, in that broader macro picture that if the banks or the big banks at least are doing okay, then maybe the rest of us are going to do okay as well? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to discount somewhat. Even though I, I love Jamie Dimon, he's probably one of the best CEOs in American history. I think sometimes you have to discount his rhetoric. You know, remember the hurricane uh, comment he made, he alluded to regarding the uh, recession in the economy, and that didn't happen. So I think that's how he hedges his bets and manages his book. But um, yeah, I thought the numbers were pretty decent and the credit quality is still good. So I, I think you can, uh, we're underweight financials, but I think that you can still look at the group and say emblematic, Let's wait for some of the big tech names who are actually beneficiaries of higher interest rates, even though it seems counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And let's see what kind of, of returns they give us uh, or earnings growth they give us. So super basic question, Nancy. Do you buy this dip <laughs> and where? <laughs> Yeah, so we we will be buying it. We we already had a list prepared of names that we were were interested in. We're still we're we're shifting our technology focus uh, in, in particularly in generative AI to software names, the applications that drive uh, AI computing. Uh, we've we've added uh, since last summer to industrials, and there's a few places we want to tweak our exposure there. So um, we'll be we'll be doing that next week, and then in. In general, um, you know, we, we like materials and energy. We're overweight, and we'll we'll look for opportunities uh, on the on our shopping list for names that we can add in there. Do you need to also kind of pair that with the safety trade, like bonds or gold, or are you comfortable sort of not doing that? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I mean, I think you're hearing a lot about that, and yeah. I think. Um, that the, it depends on what your definition of defensive is. And we think some of the large cap tech names, forget about AI, with fortress balance sheets who are benefiting from higher interest rates and have consistently, including in 2022, delivered high teens to low 20% earnings growth. We think those names are defensive and we think the secular narrative behind them supports that. But we do own names like Walmart because it fits our investing theme, which is old economy companies embracing digitization generative AI and generative AI cloud computing. So we like uh, a number of names in, in the staple space and in the old economy, uh, but we still think you have to be long tech mm -hmm. and you these opportunities to, to add to names at, at better prices. I see a couple other names uh, on your best ideas list, Nancy. One of those is Chipotle. And yes. I'm a little confused by this. I, is this tied to the upcoming stock split or you see something more fundamental to the story? No, we added it in uh, 2020 in the in sort of the midst of COVID, mm -hmm. and the stock was trading around $500 a share or $550. Uh, we still like it because they continue to deliver on pricing power. Uh, they're growing the Chipotle lanes, and about half of their bid business per store is digital. So we and it's about a million dollars a store in digital sales. So we, we we still really like the name. The the 50 for one stock split is kind of a bonus, and even though there's no economic reason for stocks to go up when mm -hmm. they split. They always do. <laughs> yeah, you know the frenzy uh, behind that. It brings a lot of attention to uh, to the stock as well, which maybe uh, draws in some folks who maybe wouldn't have given the time of day. Nancy, always appreciate you giving us the time of day. Nancy Tangler there. <laughs> she's the CEO and CIO at Laffer Tangler Investments. As we count down to the close, with just about uh, three minutes to go here, Alex. And uh, we talk about this sell-off and the idea as to whether this just creates that entry point. We saw this earlier this week, right? When you had the sell-off midweek, then a day later, you saw everybody kind of come in and say, okay, finally I can get, you know, Amazon for a little bit cheaper than what it was the day before. I mean, you have to make the argument that, look, no one wants to take material risk headed into a weekend with so much uncertainty with Iran and Israel. Mm -hmm. Legit. If we don't get something that sort of confirms those fears, why wouldn't you be buying on Monday? Yeah. I, I guess is my question. Yeah, I'm actually surprised there aren't a few people that are willing to take the risk here. I mean, you are seeing us off the lows of the day, but still uh, holding on to some, some pretty healthy mm -hmm. losses. And then it's not just what we're seeing in the equity market, right? We talk about that reversal that we're seeing in Treasury yields. Yeah. Uh, we had that uptick in gold. I know that sort of, uh, you know, a reverse, but still the fact that you saw that bump up to 2400, that's huge. It is. But also we're just up seven basis points in the 10 year. Yeah. What were we uh, down? Uh, seven basis points versus about 22 the other day. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Perspective. All right. We're going to have a full breakdown of all the price action today. So stick with us as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now.
And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. And here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. Scarlett Fu in Studio 2. Carol Masser and Tim Senevic in the radio cage. We welcome our audiences <laughs> across all of our Bloomberg platforms, including our partnership with YouTube. Um, what's setting up right now, Carol Masser, yeah. uh, to be the broadest base sell-off that we've had all year, though, on a percentage basis, not quite the worst. Yeah, check it out, too. Just Menton was in the uh, studio, or the cage, as you like to call it, Romain, earlier today, and saying the S&P 500 on pace for its worst week in 2024, and its worst week since October 27th of 2023. If that date sounds familiar, it should, because that was the bottoming, or recent bottoming, if you will, of the S&P 500, and what began a 27% climb in the S&P 500. So we're all a little bit uh, on edge here, as we watch what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah, it hasn't been a great week, but I will remind people that we are still up more than 7.3% on the S&P 500 so far this year. We're only down about 2.6% from all-time highs reached at the end of last month. Still, geopolitical concerns do have uh, certainly have investors on edge. Yeah, those geopolitical concerns are really hitting EIS, which is the ETF that tracks Israel, down for a fourth straight day, losing 2.8% right now. And we're also seeing weakening in the Israeli shekel as well when everyone's just kind of on tenterhooks waiting for the headlines. Uh, yeah, and you can really see that reflected in gold earlier, right? You had that move to 2400 and then we had sort of a sell-off, which, I mean, that's the point of gold. You buy it when you're scared, and then you also sell it when things get bad. So you can make the argument it's doing its job. So still is part of that safe haven narrative for me. A couple of days ago, it looked like the major equity indices here in the U.S. were headed for a weekly gain. But based on where we stand right now, we're setting up here for weekly losses across the board. All right, we get the closing bells here in New York. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to finish out the day down by almost about 475 points. It takes a while for these numbers to settle, but nevertheless, the damage is done. Down a percent here on the day, two and a half percent on the week. The S&P is going to finish lower by about 76 points or one and a half percent on the week and on the day as well, while the Nasdaq Composite down about 1.6 percent here on the day and about a half a percent on the week. But keep an eye on the Russell. At one point, it did trade below its 2000 level. A key line in the sand for a lot of technical traders out there is going to close slightly above that at 2003 and change down about 39 points or 1.9 percent. All right, Romain, you said it well. A uh, risk off trade certainly on this Friday session. If I look at the S&P 500, folks, uh, most of the names in the index trading lower today. Scarlet 460 to be exact. We'll get into the sectors in just a moment. 41 gaining some ground to unchanged. Yeah, if you look at the sectors, it's pretty much red across the board. Uh, there are there's one pocket of green and that would be in real estate management, um, but the main 11 sectors are all down. Uh, the worst performers here are materials, tech, and consumer discretionary, each off by at least one and a half percent. All right, I'm going to say it wasn't easy to find gainers, but I uh, got a little assist from my uh, partner in crime here, Tim. Um, so among them, first of all, an IPO, go figure. Maybe not a day that you want to uh, begin trading, but nonetheless, uh, UL Solutions, ticker ULS, uh, did just that and coming out of the gate and pretty much holding on to its gains here uh, in its first day of trading, up 25 percent here. This is a safety testing and inspection company. Uh, it did expand its IPO. It raised $946 million. The pricing, though, within the market of range, but nonetheless, out of the gate, really strong in a day where, as we just talked about, pretty much so many sectors, almost everything was down here. Also, Globe Life, Tim talked about this yesterday. It got hammered down 53% in the Thursday trade, a record decline there. Um, a different trade today. It was up about 20% um, after that uh, sell off yesterday. We know the news. It was a short seller, an anonymous short seller, Fuzzy Panda Research, released a report against Global Life, but nonetheless, investors coming back into that name today. Speaking of insurance, Allstate, also a gainer in today's trade, just up uh, up 2% at its highs today, finishing the day with about a 7 tenths, 7 tenths of 1% gain. Not sure why, but there were some re, uh, analyst calls yesterday. Evercore, also Wells Fargo, raising their price targets on this company, so a little bit of a move to the upside. And one more name, Coupang. It's a 30 $38 billion market cap e-commerce company, Korean e-commerce company. Uh, and it came out saying that it's going to raise the monthly fee for its WOW membership for new clients starting 
on Saturday. And so you saw that one really outperforming today's session up 11%. Okay, let's talk about some underperformance here because no shortage of stocks to choose from. I do want to start with uh, JP Morgan having its worst day going all the way back to June of 2022, closing down 6.5%. This after the company reported that net interest income slightly missed analyst estimates, a sign that the benefit of higher rates may be waning amid pressure to pay out more to depositors. We should note that going into the report, shares were up nearly 15%. Uh, shares up just a little over uh, around 8 percent so far this year now after this decline. Hey, do you want to check on shares of chip stocks? Because we did see both Intel and AMD as well as NVIDIA move lower today. Intel fell more than 5 percent. AMD, for its part, fell 4.2 percent. This after the Wall Street Journal reported that China has, has asked its telecom carriers to start phasing out foreign chips. The direction went to China's largest telecom carriers earlier this year to phase out foreign processors that are core to their networks by 2027. This according to the Wall Street Journal, who cited people familiar with the matter. And then finally, let's take a look at how Boeing ended up doing today after what I think it's fair to say a pretty rough today? week for the company. What's that? No, never mind. No, 2.2%. <laughs> down today, um, down more than 7% so far this year, uh, or so far this week, I should say, um, having their worst run, guys, going all the way back to uh, 2019, 2018, excuse me, um, back when its 737 MAX aircraft was involved in a deadly crash off Indonesia, mm. uh, shares down about 60% from all-time highs that were reached uh, back in 2019. Ooh, that is a brutal stat. Uh, I'm taking a look at the bond market here. We know there's been a safe haven, a safe haven move into that. Uh, the 10-year yield, for example, is down seven basis points. The seven-year uh, down eight. But I have to say, yields were down more uh, earlier in the session. Also, considering that big move that we got on the front end earlier this week, where we have a 22 basis points in one session, this doesn't feel like a huge reaction that we could have had reversing some of the earlier selling guys. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And if I go back to even the equity trade today to see that we kind of bounced off our lows and saw a little bit of buying into the uh, close, I thought that was yeah. kind of interesting. Well, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, just a counterpoint to that, though, too. I mean, I think one thing that alarmed me was just how much in lockstep we saw some of those safe haven trades trade, if you will, the idea that you had the VIX elevated, oil prices elevated, the dollar elevated. I mean, usually when you have the dollar go, in one, go up and then you usually get oil maybe going the other direction, and then you play that in with the drop that we saw in yields and, and then I guess that brief embrace of gold. I don't know. I mean, I feel like this is a little bit different than maybe some of the last uh, the last big sell-offs that we had. Yeah, we did speak to Hagar Shamali earlier in our program, and, and she said that, look, I'm not an alarmist here. She spent years working at the State Department. She said, I'm not an alarmist, but I, I am very concerned right now. But All that that said, guys, we could go the weekend and not see anything happen. Can I say, I actually listened to that interview. First of all, it was a great interview, uh, uh, Tim. And, I, and then I'm glad you pushed back because I, I actually found it alarmist. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I mean, her tone. And I know that, you know, the tone that you're going to get from someone like that versus, say, an actual investor who maybe has a little bit more of a buffer is going to be different. But I did think that what she said about just the potential that this could be uh, bigger, I guess, than, than maybe some of the previous incidents. Yeah, I think escalation yeah. is certainly a concern. I mean, look, what what's the U, what could the U.S. do in response? And and that's that's what she said. You know, she essentially said, okay, well, we could see warships ending up, uh, you know, being deployed as a result of, of some sort of attack. But I think the uh, you know a lot of people want to well, avoid getting into something that could be considered um, you know a, a widespread conflict. She also though did also say that Iran knows its limitations and and how much it can kind of push the United States. So they're going to be maybe thoughtful uh, in terms of what kind of retaliation. They do. So um, we'll see what happens this weekend. I mean, going back to kind of our bread and butter in terms of the markets, uh, folks are saying we had Bill Maloney and JJ Kinahan in here and said, again, if nothing happens, um, you could see investors certainly come back into the market. So we will certainly wait and see what, what ultimately happens and whether or not we get escalation to another level. Yeah. So I was saying, like, do, if we don't see anything, do we get the buy the dip uh, kind of scenario yeah. um, uh, for that? Can we pivot here? Is that yeah. is that okay? Can we talk bagels That's allowed. and some other yeah. stuff? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to some of the interesting stories that maybe didn't move markets but are quite interesting and will impact how you maybe live your life, and that's McDonald's. So apparently, guys, you know this, that because California raised the minimum wage, McDonald's wants to get more people in the stores, so they're bringing back bagels to help them do that. Yeah, they're doing that. Well, they're dealing with this, what, mandatory 25% bump in pay. So they're trying to figure out, okay, we've got to figure out how do we pay for this. And apparently, although Tim and I are kind of scratching our heads, <laughs> bagels were a really popular thing at McDonald's, which makes me wonder, okay, who told them to take them away, first of all, if it brings uh, traffic in. But nonetheless, because they know this, they did a focus group 
they're going to kind of reintroduce them. And they're actually doing some marketing, which is what they don't normally yeah, do on a local scale. Yeah, local marketing, just in California, spending $15 million there, um, which could be significant. I think a couple things to keep in mind here. One is um, it can end up costing a lot of money for these franchisees to pay these uh, wages, these higher wages, $250,000 per restaurant. Well, that's a lot of money. But everywhere is going to have to raise wages. So Every, all prices are going to go up. Every every restaurant is dealing with this. All I have to say is bagels in California yeah. don't usually work out well. <laughs> no. That's all. Here we go. <laughs> Shots we, fired. we talked about this. She would be right. Carbs? Bagels yeah. in New York. Carbs? Really good. Um, no, it, it's the water. The water. The water. The water's oh, come on. <laughs> You're probably a pizza snob, too, aren't Of course. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, on that note. That's a wrap, guys. Have a good and safe weekend. Oh, That's going to do it for our cross-platform. Radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will see you same time, same place on Monday. All right, we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. A full week uh, to really digest here. And we're going to have Chris Kane from Bloomberg Intelligence with our factors that actually drove the market. Stick around. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romaine Bostic. What a way to end the week, yeah. Scarlett, here. We've been kind of up and down all week long. And, of course, a big sell-off today in the markets. Most of that tied to what we've been seeing in the geopolitical space. A lot of concerns right now about the Iranian response to those uh, most recent Israeli strikes here. You saw the S&P 500 move lower on the day by about 1.5% here. That's the second biggest decline on a percentage basis of the week. But in terms of the number of companies that declined, this is the broadest based sell-off that we've had all year long. In fact, the broad us since we go back uh, to mid-December. That was back when we had that big Fed pivot that rattled a lot of folks. You saw a big bid come into commodities, uh, particularly, actually, you saw it in a lot of the precious metals. You saw it in the industrial metals, and you saw it in oil here on the day. The VIX was elevated back above 18 at one point here on the day, and you see the slight drop in yields. It may not look like much, Scarlet, given the 22, 23 basis points we saw a couple days ago, but this is a move we haven't seen in quite some time, and it shows you, at least on the macro right now, there is some concern. Absolutely. A rush to save Havens. Let's get you a look at some of the individual movers on the day. We're going to start with Zoetis, losing almost 8% on the day. This is the animal health company, and it's down on a report that U.S. and European regulators are, are conducting reviews of its arthritis drugs after a, uh, reports that there are thousands of uh, side effects uh, experienced by animals. So that stock taking a bit of a hit. I want to move on to the financial sector, where Progressive defied the overall sell-off in equities uh, after its first quarter profit beat analyst estimates, reflecting what analysts call a favorable auto environment. Remember, the CPI report we got earlier this week showed that services inflation, like car insurance, accelerated in the month of March. And the worst performer among the banks in the KBW Bank Index was J.P. Morgan Chase, losing 6.5% on the day. In fact, I looked at how it typically responds to earnings. This was the biggest earnings trigger decline in about two years. We know the story here. Net interest income, uh, Miss Analyst Estimates, it's a sign that, of course, higher rates is forcing banks like J.P. Morgan to pay up for depositors. Now, our top story this hour is feeling the impact of geopolitical risks converging with tepid lending profits at the big banks. You had news reports that Iran is getting ready to attack Israeli government targets as soon as this weekend, serving as a crucial reminder that perhaps investors got too complacent about the ongoing war in the Middle East. And while the stock market was counting on earnings to justify this year's rally, first quarter results from the likes of J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup show that high rates are no longer so profitable to their bottom line. Right, well, let's talk about, uh, Scarlett, what actually moved the market on the day, on the week, and really, quite frankly, over the last few months. Chris Kane joining us right now for Factor Friday. It's in our equity strategist over at Bloomberg Intelligence. And before we get to the first factor, Chris, I just do want to get your take here on today. I mean, we saw these moves. Some of that was tied to earnings. Some of that was tied to the macro and the Fed picture. But obviously, a lot of that was geopolitics, right? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the, the market is worried about what you were just, were just talking about with Iran and, mm -hmm. uh, and Israel. But, you know, we've been flagging that, you know, momentum 
not the momentum factor, but the momentum of the market has been waning for a couple months, even as even as the market has made higher highs. So, mm -hmm. you know, this pullback isn't super surprising in uh, what's been a secular bull market. Particularly given uh, how the big gains that we saw in the first quarter of 2024. And now that that is in the books, everybody was kind of looking ahead to whether that was going to carry over into uh, the second quarter here. Uh, how have those uh, traditional equity factors been performing? You know, now that uh, Q1 is in the books, we could say that the equities have, or the factors have done very, very well this year so far. You know, we'll start with value, which is the laggard. It's up like about 1% on a long short basis, so nothing crazy. But the other four, uh, other three main factors, you know, have done really, really well. So low volatility stocks have been high volatility stocks by about 6% in 2024. Mm -hmm. When you think about the market generally going up, that's pretty impressive. A lot of times when there's a bull market, you know, investors go to high volatility stocks. We haven't seen that. And then profitability is up 10% long short and then momentum. High momentum has beaten low momentum by 13%. That's one of the biggest three-month moves we have in history. We've actually looked at all the rolling uh, three-month long short momentum returns since 2000. This last uh, three-month return is in the 98th percentile of history. So it's kind of rarefied air for momentum to start the year. Something that's not an official factor but maybe should be are the mega caps. Yeah. <laughs> They've dominated the market over the past year. What, what does your research show you about their prospects going forward? Sure. So, you know, obviously, like you said, mega caps have dominated, right? Um, but I would be a little bit hesitant to extrapolate that too far into the future because historically it's been the opposite. So we did a study where every month we invested in the top 10 uh, biggest market cap stocks in the S&P 500 equal weight and then the other bottom 490. Since the beginning of 2023, the top 10 is up 86%, where the bottom 490 is up only 19%. So mega caps have dominated. But if you take that back all the way to 2000, you see the opposite, where you see the top 10 up only 360%, where the bottom 490 is up over 900% or approaching 900%. So I would be you know, uh, a little bit hesitant to extrapolate that too far into the future. All right, Chris, going to have to leave it there. Chris Kane of Bloomberg Intelligence, a closer look at the factors that moved the market this week in the equity space. And now we turn to what happened in the Treasury space. And actually, at one point here on the week, it looked like we were heading for a continuation of the sell-off on a weekly basis. Of course, that did happen, but today a lot of that flipped. Joining us right now to talk a little bit more about what happened and, more importantly, what could happen next is Bank of America's Director of U.S. Rate Strategy, Megan Swiber. All right, Megan, I do want to get your thoughts here just on the moves that we saw this week because it was a wild ride for Treasury. A lot of people looked at that sell-off and said, this is it keep driving those rates higher. And then we got that wake up call today. First sign of trouble, you know where people run. They run to the dollar and they run to the US Treasury market. Yeah, that's that's right, Romaine. I would I would say that we've been really proven correct in our guidance to investors to be patient on adding duration. Really largely looking at this range between four and 450 for the 10 year. When we saw rates approaching this 450 level as of close yesterday, we were saying that this is a nice level for investors to begin adding to duration and moving long. Mm -hmm. um, the Fed cuts are getting pushed back. Our own U.S. econ team has pushed back the timing of cuts from June to December this year. But it's still cuts that are on the table, not hikes. Uh, and when we have a Fed that's that's still committed to lowering rates, you still have a strong buyer base of investors looking to buy the dip here. Mm -hmm. And and really, again, as as you mentioned, Treasuries are the risk free asset class. I, I am I, I am curious though, on that point, Megan. And maybe you can't answer this question because this kind of gets more into investor psychology. But why don't you think we've seen a more fuller on embrace? of duration. I mean, let's just set aside what happened today. I mean, there were, the, everything you said, I, I mean, that's, that, to me, that seems like common sense, but there are a lot of folks you know that just don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, you know, it really has been a meaningful repricing of rates to start the year, a, a year that has felt very similar to last year, where investors were set up to be long duration. We see that in our FX and rate sentiment survey that we conducted at B of A just published this morning. Uh, investors were quite long U.S. rates again headed into, into the start of the year, expecting a Fed that was going to be cutting sooner. So it is this pain trade for the market to have seen rates sell off as much as they have. And alongside that, we have seen some moderation in those U.S. duration longs. We have, though, seen investors embrace with kind of two hands this long duration view that we see in the euro area, where we have an ECB listening to Lagarde yesterday that's still set up to cut in June. And so we're looking at a, a sooner, perhaps faster cutting cycle in some of these other regions than what we have in the U.S. So it's a combination of that, the macro data, the, the central bank narrative, and then 
also the relative positioning that we've seen from, from investors that's contributed to these moves. So, Megan, notwithstanding the move that we saw in Treasuries today, is 5% still inevitable on the 10-year? So, Scarlett, we think 5% would be a level that a lot of investors would flock into to buy rates. 5% is achievable if we do have the Fed putting hikes back on the table. Uh, As we know and as we talk a lot about in the Treasury market, there's ample amount of Treasury supply given the size of deficits. What we really have seen is a very strong buyer base. And again, that's kind of a buy it well last mentality that we have from investors with expectations that Fed cuts are on the horizon. If those cuts come out more fully, 5% becomes more possible. And we saw that investor sentiment get tested in a couple of the auctions earlier this week, but we saw tails at. Um, though, again, kind of the, the sentiment that we're feeling this morning and, and during, during the trading session today is still endorsing this fact that Treasuries have this risk-off behavior. When, when we see financial conditions tightening, when we see the equity market selling off, investors are going to run uh, to, to Treasuries. Yeah, absolutely. And that's playing out today. Um, when it comes to the credit markets, uh, we have incredibly tight spreads here for investment grade and for high yield, certainly the higher quality ones. Um, how is that looking based on the survey that you conducted on sentiment? So sentiment right now um, is shifting in terms of that general view from investors to want to be long duration. And I say, you know, kind of duration more broadly, that a big part of that is also the duration exposure that we see investors get in in IG and high yield. Um, Though when you look at this, and one of the flows reports that I do on a weekly basis still shows that there's ample amounts of inflows into fixed income, into these ag benchmark, excuse me, ag benchmark funds Mm -hmm. that have to go out and deploy that liquidity. And what do they do on the back of that? They either buy treasury futures or they're putting that that to work in spread space and buying IG high yield. So still seeing a fair amount of inflows um, into duration. I would say that more broadly, this long conviction from investors is moderating a bit. Mm -hmm. And really, that's driven by and what our our FX rate sentiment survey shows is, is a pivot in terms of how um, our, 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 our surveyed participants are thinking about that Fed terminal rate of the cycle. So instead of getting to a level closer to 3%, investors are thinking that that will sit closer to 3.5, yeah. 3.75, which is really consistent with how our econ team is thinking about things, too. Megan, really appreciate your joining us. Megan Swiber Any of time. Bank of America. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the top three uh, movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. Two of them involve sports. This is The Close. season is here. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. now for the top three where we name drop some of the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Kathy Wood. Her ARK Investment Management this week took a stake in OpenAI. This is the firm, of course, behind ChatGPT. We don't know how much money uh, her venture fund forked over for the stake, but OpenAI does represent about 4% of the fund's holding. Yeah, I mean, you could kind of do the back math. I think it's interesting because she already had a stake in Anthropic, right? Mm-hmm. Or the venture fund in about Anthropic. 5%. Yeah. And then there was another company that I'm forgetting as well. So she's clearly, at least, you know, based on these investments, she clearly sees some opportunity here. She's long AI. She's she's long AI. But well, but remember, some of her comments about AI, particularly as it, as it relates to her public funds, mm-hmm. you know, the, the uh, equity funds that she has. Remember, she was notoriously not involved in yeah. NVIDIA because she said it was overvalued. And yeah. a lot of people were questioning, well, why aren't you in AI? And she's like, well, look, I am in AI, just not, you know, the, the overhyped stuff. Yeah. Long, long, long-term yeah, bets, absolutely. right? Uh, so a story that caught my eye and a person that caught my eye uh, is a marathon runner. Her name is uh, Buzanesh Deba, uh, Ethiopian. She came in second place in the Boston Marathon in 2014. Okay. She won $25,000 for that. Wall Street Journal had a great story today because the person who beat her in that race got disqualified for doping. Now, as a result, she's now the winner and she should get the prize money for first place, which is 100000 except she can't collect. 
just 10 years ago. Why not? Well, apparently they have this weird rule that they can only give her the prize money once they reallocate it from the person who they it was given back. to it. So they have to claw it back <laughs> from the person who took it and give it back. And they said they've been having trouble yeah. reaching her. Uh, well, I would expect so. And I'm sure, you know, 100000 that was a number of years ago. So there's inflation as well. Yeah, right? I feel like they should, uh, when they do claw it back, she should get interest, right? Yeah, there you, you know, go. she had put that in Bitcoin right now. It's like, you know. <laughs> or NVIDIA for that matter. Or NVIDIA, right. All right. The last person I'm watching is Tiger Woods at the Masters. You had stormy conditions shortening the opening round yesterday that left Tiger and others unable to complete their first round. That means he played 23 holes today on Friday to complete rounds one and two. So we'll see if he makes uh, the cut to play this weekend. Only the top 50 players can do so. Yeah, I, I mean, look, we're all rooting for him, but I... I I have to be honest, I find this kind of cringe, you know, because, I mean, we've seen this play out before. He's, he's a shadow of his former he, self. It doesn't matter. He's, he's going down in history as yeah. one of the greatest, and I know he's still chasing that record, but his body just, and, and particularly not, and we talked about this, I think, yesterday, when you have bad weather like this, yeah. not good for Tiger. No, it's not yeah. good. I mean, he, what, has been at the Masters 26 times, and yeah. he's made the cut 23 straight times, so. Well, of course, a lot of people will be watching, and I think, at least for the PGA, that's the point. Anyway, next week is going to be a big week for, well, tax filers. I don't know if you filed yours yet, uh, Scarlett, but your time is I running did. out. I did. I finally did. We're going to have a discussion with, about the last minute preparations with Bill Harris. He's the former uh, CEO over at Intuit. All right, a modest uh, day in the oil market, but actually the price action underneath it was significant here. We actually saw WTI reach the highest levels going back to October. Brent crude now above 90 bucks a barrel, an unprecedented move potentially by Iran that threatens to disrupt a significant portion of global oil output. Julia Fanzara is joining us right now, Bloomberg oil reporter. Uh, and Julia, I, I mean, obviously this is still a lot of speculation. We don't actually know what's going to happen. But just the idea here that we could have an escalation of this conflict uh, between Israel and Iran, and we should point out, not Iran's proxies, but Iran itself, that seems to be, really be rattling the market. Exactly. And because the Middle East controls one third of the world's crude, that's what's really baked into the markets right now. It is that geopolitical risk premium. But as you saw in the markets, we shot up 3% but came down because unless traders see the risk actually manifesting into crude supplies off of the market, they're going to be a little bit more cautious about going max long in crude markets. Just, just real quickly, though, what is the risk? Is the risk on the production or is the risk more on the delivery? I think it's both, because okay. as you saw, there were d the deliveries with the shipping incidents in the Red Sea when the Houthis were attacking all these merchant ships, but also the production, because obviously Iran produces a lot of crude. And if there are sanctions, there's all of these what ifs that traders are worrying about, but yeah. can't really pin. Yeah, the idea that we're just entering a new phase of this conflict, one where it'll be very difficult to walk back is alarming. What does the positioning look like? I know that you've been reporting on how hedge funds are positioned right now when it comes to oil. Hedge funds are maximum long right now, and so are commodity trading advisors. They are really putting out all the risk, which is why some traders are nervous that prices have really reached the top of the near end until we see something else fundamental push prices higher. And so even though a lot of traders are expecting $100 this year, you're going to need something else fundamental to push crude a little bit higher. Yeah, that, that's certainly so. I, I do want to, again, try to avoid speculation, but if we do sort of see an increase in military conflict, based on the positioning that you're seeing out there, whether it's in the futures market, the cash market, or an options market here, does that mean that if we do see a huge escalation, we're also going to see a significant pop, or is the positioning now in a place where it's going to be more muted? Some of it's baked in, but there is still a little bit of room to go once if military escalations do happen. And I think traders are also wondering what if, if Iran escalates, what is that escalation going to be? Because if it isn't as big as they anticipated, prices might actually come off is what some traders are telling me. Julia Fanzaras, thank you so much. Julia, of course, covering the oil market for us as crude oil prices increase. We're going to stick with this topic and bring in now from Washington, Joe Matthew, co-host of Bloomberg's Balance of Power. And Joe, the headline that has uh, oil traders and certainly traders across financial markets concerned is that Israel is bracing for a direct and unprecedented attack by Iran on government yeah. targets as soon as Saturday. What is the U.S. government saying about this? Has it confirmed this, uh, this, these reports? 
Well, no, everyone's being pretty careful about this. I mean, to be clear, the White House has been talking about the expectation, the possibility of this happening for days now. And, and they are actually taking some steps in case it does happen. To your point, we have huge questions about the where, the when, the how. But we are hearing that Iran could move as soon as tomorrow, questioning whether it would act on its own or through proxies. I can tell you, though, they've sent General Eric Carrilla, the commander of U.S. Central Command, to Israel in anticipation of this. And the government is telling U.S. Embassy uh, staff living there to be very careful about where they go, restricting travel inside Israel. And it is making us feel like that something could be imminent here should it happen. The White House being very careful about speaking specifically and in detail about what might occur. Uh, as, they, as they should be. I'm going to ask a sensitive question here, Joe, because there's been a lot of questions as to what would embolden uh, Iran to do something like this at this time. And there have been a lot of people saying mm -hmm. that the criticism by the Biden administration of the Netanyahu administration and overall a lot of the concerns about some of the tactics that the IDF has used might have maybe given a signal to Iran or some of its proxies that they could get away with something like this now. That is part of the analysis, Romain. You're right. And all of this is sensitive to talk about here. There are so many questions about exactly what would motivate Iran. Would this actually happen now? And, and would they be willing to open a wider conflict? So far, Tehran has not wanted to do that. But look, we grew up around this possibility, and we've been told for years that this could not only begin a regional war, but could lead to a global conflict. The stakes are incredibly high right now, and we can't underscore that enough. Well said. The Israel Hamas were, of course, uh, really exposing President Biden's weaknesses uh, with different uh, interest groups in the United States. I want to transition now to something that the president has been doing to try to shore up his support with younger people, which is student debt. He's looking to cancel seven billion dollars in student debt. This is obviously an election year push. How of I mean, how much of a done deal is this or is this simply a proposal that he's floating out there? Hmm. Yeah, it's not a done deal. Uh, look, as the president has learned already, there are legal problems here. We're already hearing uh, complaints about the fairness issue from the other side of the aisle. But the president's trying here, the administration trying to essentially qualify uh, a, a smaller group of people, a more specific group of people. For instance, those who have principle uh, that is smaller than the debt that they that they now owe some of them in some cases paying loans for over 20 years the president wants to kind of uh, shrink the circle of those who might be eligible to see if it gets through court if it does not politically speaking the campaign says look the president still gets caught in the act trying and that for them is enough mm -hmm. but i have to admit we've heard from a lot of young people and we've heard from this in our polling at bloomberg mm -hmm. that they see this as a promise unkept by the president and trying just might not be enough joe matthew comes up uh, right after this program, 5 p.m. Washington time, along with Kaylee Lines, Balance of Power. They will have full coverage of everything going on out of Washington and, of course, uh, the potential Washington response to the Iranian response to those Israeli strikes. All right, we're going to make a hard pivot from that and push ahead to what's happening next week here in the United States. It is tax day. The IRS gearing up for a busy season and uh, Scarlett, only three days left to file before Monday's deadline. I was just looking at the numbers, Scarlett. About 102 million people have already done their filings already, and I'm told that you're one of those. Yeah, people. I did. I know. <laughs> that It's rare that I actually get things done uh, in time. I hope our next guest has already done his taxes because he is the former CEO of the parent company of TurboTax, Intuit. He's also the founder of PayPal and uh, Personal Capital, as well as a lot of other ventures. Really pleased to say that Bill Harris is joining us here in studio, too. Bill, great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks. Uh, I, I want to ask if you've done your taxes already but we always go through this parlor. Well, the fact is I have not because I've extended to October. Okay. As anybody with K-1s and a complex tax return typically ends up in that situation. Well, that's a good, I'm glad you went there because this gets to the idea of why people do put off doing their taxes. Yes. Um, you know, there are, is at least one person on this set, not named Scarlett, who still hasn't done their taxes. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of us do kind of dread it because we, you know, we are worried about how complicated things are. Or of course, if we owe money, we kind of want to put that off as well here. Uh, I mean, what was your kind of experience in dealing with people and clients and just the users of your product? Well, here's what it is. Uh -huh. um, People think a lot about taxes just coming up to April 15th. Mm -hmm. But they think about last year's taxes, and there's nothing you can do at this point. Mm -hmm. So this is the opportunity, while you're thinking about taxes, while you're feeling this year's pain, think about next year. Set yourself up, your investments for this year, for 2024, such that next April 15th, it will be less painful.
Yeah, you're already one quarter into the new tax year, so you may as well get going, right? Get going now. Okay, so I have a question about, I'm going to rip up the script here because you've mentioned that you are postponing filing, or no, you're going to file, but you're um, not going to officially file I, I file, file an extension. Right. Yeah. So by filing an extension, there's a lot of concern that perhaps that makes you more of a target for being audited. What really are the risks of filing an extension? Um, the thing that makes you more at risk of an audit is uh, complicated uh, uh, investments. But why do you extend? <laughs> because you have complicated investments. Exactly. I'm still waiting for K-1s. I'm still waiting for a number of things that will not be available until the summer. But I'm in an unusual situation. Um, most people have everything they need, should file by April 15th. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to do and get it out of the way so you can start planning for next year. Well, can I, Planning, though, that's a good yeah. point, too, because and my accountant always reminds me of this is like why I only call him on like, you know, April 3rd and I, bet, and I don't and call I, him in February or in December and the months prior. And I bet <laughs> yeah. your dentist tells you to brush your teeth, too. And you forget that one as well. Yeah. You know, it's here's the thing. Um, it's a should do versus a must do. Uh -huh. Preparing and filing your taxes is a must do. Mm -hmm. Planning is a should do. Mm -hmm. It's worth a lot of money. If you do it, no one does. So one thing that I think people are going to be surprised by this year, I was reading that the downside of high yield savings accounts is that a lot of people are going to face a higher tax liability from the income that they earned through these accounts. And perhaps they're not quite ready for that. Does that mean that they're going to be, I don't know, in a different tax bracket entirely? Well, here's the thing. For your cash, there are different strategies for different asset classes. But for your cash, bank accounts and CDs are the worst place to put them because there you get the very highest tax rates. Mm -hmm. If you're a high income taxpayer in New York City, you're gonna have 13.5% state and city tax plus the federal, and that can take you up to 54% marginal tax rate. On the interest that you earn in On your bank account. On the interest in your bank account. And so if you're making 4%, you're not. You're really making 2%. You're not even what, keeping up with inflation. Then what should have been the alternative? What should have been the choice people should have made? There are many, but the yeah. one I like is short-term treasury bills. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you are in a um, high-yield savings account today, you're going to get about 4.5%. T-bills mm -hmm. are 5.3%. Mm -hmm. And even more important, treasury bills are exempt from state and city taxes. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that for somebody, once again, who's a high-income taxpayer in New York City, that means the tax equivalent yield is close to 7%. 7% mm -hmm. on an investment that is as safe and secure like as they come. Yeah, and that gets to the idea, given how elevated rates have gotten, and if you believe that at least baseline rates are going to stay where they are for quite some time here, I think a lot of people have strategies right now that are probably a little outdated. Yes. Yeah. Yes. People have not adopted to the new era of uh, higher interest rates. Yeah. And not only have they not moved money from checking accounts into high yield savings, but they haven't even started to consider the tax impact. Mm -hmm. And most individuals, they don't even think that it's possible to buy treasuries. Right. But it is. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you go with the thing that's the easiest, right? And yes. Finally, moving it into a high-yield savings account is already a mammoth move for, for so many people. That's right. Bill, really appreciate your joining us and, you know, hope uh, tax day works out for you in October. In October, <laughs> in October. yes. <laughs> Former Thank you. Intuit CEO Bill Harris, which, of course, is the owner of TurboTax. All right, Romaine, um, we wrapped up a week that was yeah. quite the week, right? Because it, it looked like we we're going to end the week with gains and instead... We had this swoon at the end of the week, and mm -hmm. we finished with losses. The S&P 500 closing down, not at its lows, but lower by 1.5%. And it shows you the fragility of the market, right? Because yeah. you go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and it was basically a flip-flop. I mm -hmm. mean, just yesterday we were talking about the resurgence of the MAG-7, and today you had uh, one Magnificent 7 stock in the green, and everything else sold off hard. But I was speaking with Alex Steele a little bit earlier, and, I mean, she's kind of kept joking about this idea is, is this thin, that buy-the-dip moment? Maybe, maybe in. not. Like I mean, if nothing happens over the weekend and with the issue in the Middle there's East, there's still a lot of does earnings that give to get people, through. Does that give people confidence? Yeah, you got to wait for the earnings because that's that, that's what's been keeping the stock market hope alive. This is the close on Bloomberg.
Masters teed off yesterday in Augusta, Georgia, albeit after a few weather delays. And of course, a big part of what propels the golf industry forward is the equipment used by athletes such as Tiger Woods. Bridgestone Golf prides itself on its quality golf balls, clubs, and custom apparel. Joining us now for more is Dan Murphy, President and CEO of Bridgestone Golf, joining us from Atlanta. Dan, so good to speak with you. Um, I know you've been watching the tournament. I. I got to ask you, of course, we're all obsessed with Tiger Woods and whether he makes the cut because, of course, he's setting records. He wants to set another record. He's not um, actually one of the, uh, the endorsers of your products, but you do work with him. How critical is his achievement, his success on the greens to products and uh, sales of golf products overall? Oh, he's huge. He's been playing our product for a long time. And there's an old saying in the business win on Sunday, sell on Monday. And that really holds true for when Tiger goes out, plays our product, plays it well. And I am happy to report some good news that he did make the cut today. All right. About 30 minutes ago. So we're looking forward to a big weekend. And, you know, you never know what can happen at, uh, at the Masters. He, he does a great job for us, not only as uh, playing our ball at, at great tournaments like the Masters, but he's really great with us uh, in R&D. He works with us um, very intimately with our engineers and and he's a real golf geek actually yeah and uh, when it comes to spin of the ball distance of the ball he's he's super helpful so we kind of have a, a relationship with him that has two benefits one is that validation on the golf course that we got the best product in the world and the second one is he helps us develop the next generation of products so it's, it's a great relationship so I have to ask you, the Masters mass matters to so many people, especially in the last couple of years, because it brings together golfers from the PGA Tour and, of course, from Live Golf as well. And, you know, the civil war in golf has kind of, I yeah. don't know, become a cold war. They're not really talking to each other. We're not sure what's going to happen. There's, it's just very, very tense. Is this split in golf a good thing or a bad thing for the business of golf overall? It certainly got people talking about it. And usually controversy is a good thing. Well, I think it's generally a bad thing. Uh, we haven't seen it play out at the retail level. Golf really boomed during the pandemic. It's up about 20% from pre-pandemic, and it's staying up there. So we've been enjoying some really good sales numbers and, and some good activity. But I will say on the professional tour, it has been a little distracting. Mm -hmm. And our preference, my preference, our company's preference is they get back together again. We think having all the best players play in the same place at the same time will draw ratings and, and keep this boom going. So we'd prefer to see them get back together. And we, th we think they will eventually. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think most of us kind of definitely, well, at least we hope they, they will, Dan. Uh, I do think, though, I mean, underlying that, though, there has been a lot of discussion here about uh, broadening, uh, broadening out the sport, the idea of getting more people in, the bigger international audience. And I thought, I thought for years the PJ was doing a relatively good job with that. I know they hit some speed bumps over the last couple of years. But it gets to the question as to how important these major tournaments are, at least the four majors uh, uh, that we have, uh, the three in the U.S. And, and the one over there in Britain. How much of a bump do you typically see in interest and for that matter, sales following these tournaments? Well, I mean, the Masters, is it's its funny. It's like having the Super Bowl right out of the gate. It's the biggest event of the year. It draws the most viewers, and we see the, the biggest bump from it. It's really the traditional uh, beginning of the golf season. It's when the northern markets are all open, the southern markets are already open. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it really drives the industry in a big way. And you know, we are thrilled that golf is becoming – more of what we always wanted it to be. Guys like me that have been in the business for 30 years, mm -hmm. we're, we're really happy to see not only is it growing, but it's growing. There's more women coming to the game, more females, more, uh, more diversity coming to the game, more people of color. Um, youth, the youth movement is on fire. Kids are coming to play the game in, in, in greater numbers. So the outlook for golf is really good. All right, uh, Dan, we're going to have to leave it there. Appreciate you taking time for us. Dan Murphy, he's the president and CEO of Bridgestone Golf, and you heard him uh, break the news a little bit earlier. Tiger Woods did indeed make the cut, Scarlett. 24th so, Street time. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot to watch uh, over the weekend. We do want to bring you some breaking news that just crossing the wire. This involving U.S. sanctions against Russia. Those sanctions now expanding uh, for the use of Russian medals on exchanges here. I'm just going to read it straight to you here. The U.S. is announcing these new restrictions right now. This is largely going to restrict trading in Russian aluminum, copper, and nickel. Again, this adds to existing sanctions that are already out there, and this will apply to any Russian aluminum, copper, and nickel produced on or after April 13th. We'll get you some more details on that, but stick around. We're going to set you up for what to watch over the next week. This is Bloomberg.
Well, earnings season ostensibly kicked off with the big banks. We heard from quite a few, including J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citi. And next week, we hear from quite a few others, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs on tap. Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Bank Analyst Allison Williams joining us now for more. Let's start off with Goldman Sachs here. What are you expecting? So we're expecting a good quarter in trading and investment banking fees. That's the core of Goldman's business. And also, we're expecting a much cleaner quarter. So they're going back to the core of their business, right? So last year was a lot of cleanup. We had another sale that closed in the first quarter, but most of the financial impacts have been felt. And we're not going to see those big commercial real estate impairment charges that we saw last year. Actually, Wells Fargo showing a little bit of a decline in their non-performers this quarter, a little bit. Oh, that was a surprise. A little bit, yeah, right? I, so yeah. at the margin. Yeah. Um, also for Goldman Sachs, you know, they're going to have uh, probably some nice gains from investment income, but we're yeah. going to look at that their comp accruals should be stable and their overall costs. Are they, you know, keeping their house in order? Let's talk about Morgan Stanley because the big headline cross that multiple regulators are looking right. into the wealth management arm. What are we expecting to hear from that wealth business? So my guess is we're not going to hear on the legal front, probably they're not going to say much. Um, but, you know, our legal expert, Elliot Stein, has said it's about 250 to 500 million is the risk. So that's very manageable in their mm. pre-tax earnings. But wealth, the wealth flows, that is really where we're focusing. They had huge inflows first half of last year. They really lost a lot of momentum. They guided down on the pre-tax margin last quarter. So we think, you know, they're going to come in, you know, they're going to meet or beat that margin, um, especially with the markets being as they were last quarter. And it's a good start to this quarter, even mm -hmm. though, you know, it's yeah. choppy, the markets, yeah. um, you know, the assets price yeah. on, the, on the last day of last quarter so yeah i mean despite the price action today the results actually weren't that bad we're talking about slight misses on right certain metrics and others allison great to catch up with you we'll talk to her next week quite a big uh, big batch of earnings coming out next week from the banks as well as other financial companies as well scarlet and that includes bank of america and charles schwab discover also Discover, yes, which of course is um, got that deal with Capital One. So I expect to hear a lot of commentary mm -hmm. on that. Don't forget, Netflix kicks things off for yes. the tech companies as well. Yeah. So we'll be all over that. Yeah, and that's definitely become kind of the bellwether yep. for uh, maybe how the market goes, uh, how Netflix goes, so goes the market, uh, as they say, United Airlines and a few others. Uh, some other things going on next week. Uh, here in New York, I'm told that the former president, uh, Donald Trump, that hush money trial is scheduled to start. That's a key phrase, scheduled to start. Mm -hmm. Will it actually start or will there be some kind of delay? Because that's kind of been the MO of uh, his le legal team. So we'll see. Yeah. And in the world of cryptocurrencies, the Bitcoin halving. We've been talking about this forever. It's finally here, Scarlett. Everyone on the internet yeah. is going to go How are you bananas. celebrating? Do we need special glasses for this? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Did, did I take a whole fork and try to break <laughs> it apart? I don't know. Uh, oh, anyway, we will have full coverage of that as well. And it could have an impact on prices. Bitcoin closing out the week just uh, around that 70000 level. We're also going to get the IMF and World Bank meetings starting next week as well. Yeah, so a lot of focus on macro um, headwinds and, of course, what projections everyone has for the global economy, especially with the ECB getting ready to cut interest rates. And Friday will, and Scarlett will be off next Friday because she's going to be listening <laughs> uh, to Taylor Swift's new album. I know yeah. you've got your whole day just absolutely, blown out for that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'm yeah. like, queuing it all up on Spotify. Can't wait. All right. Uh, we will have coverage of all of that, including uh, Miss Taylor Swift. Thanks for joining us here on The Close. Balance of Power up next. Scarlett and I will be back next week.